Yes, we've, we've got this room set up as a sort of non-active learning space today, but um, that shouldn't stop you from getting up and getting more food because it looks very delicious. Um, so please do that. And I'm going <coughs> to set myself a little timer so I don't take up too much time so that we have time to have a bit of a conversation at the end as well. Um, thank you very much for the intro, David. Um, yes, as David says, I'm Jen Ross. Um, I have been in Las Vegas, and then I was in San Francisco, and now I'm here, and then I'm going to Canada. So packing for this trip proved to be exceedingly difficult. I had to basically think in terms of, which, which you have to do in Scotland anyway, I had to think in terms of layers, right? At some point, I was going to need to take them off, and at some point, I was going to need to put them on. And it's all worked out fine, but I've taken the, the biggest suitcase that I've ever taken on a trip, and it's enormous. And I had to carry it up a big flight of stairs um, in San Francisco, and Weekend, and I was regretting it. But apart from that, I'm having a fantastic, fantastic trip, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, and thank you very much, David, for inviting me. And um, I think that what you're doing here in terms of thinking about active learning spaces is really interesting. And I'm hoping over the next 45 minutes to an hour to give you a sense of why it is that I think that an active learning space and a digital learning space are really compatible ideas, even if not exactly the same thing. Um, so that's kind of in part what I'm trying to do. Um, a little bit of context around me and my program, um, which is what I'm going to focus on today. I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, a massive open online course that I was involved in teaching earlier this year um, called e-learning and digital cultures. So part of the talk will focus on the master's program and part of it will focus on the MOOC with some sort of overarching themes which will make it all fit together in a fantastic way. Um, that will be good. Um, so the program is uh, a big online distance program at the University of Edinburgh. It's one of the oldest online distance programs at Edinburgh. Um, for those who don't know the university, it's kind of a very ancient university, um, one of the oldest in the UK, one of the kind of most prestigious in the UK. And so the online distance aspects of what it is that Edinburgh does is sort of um, in the context of a research intensive really kind of thinks of itself as being and is a very, um, very prestigious, <coughs> great university. Um, so we have had a lot of support over the last six years in doing what we do and recently in the last couple of years there's been a big funding um, input into the university from within the university to develop a whole bunch of new online distance master's programs. There's going to be 4.5 million pounds invested over five years to develop something like 20 new master's, online master's programs. Um, so the university strategy is increasingly moving towards online master's provision, um, which makes our life kind of interesting as people who've been doing that for a little while because people have become quite interested. They were interested before, but now they're really interested <laughs> um, in what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, so it, it's a real pleasure to be able to come and kind of share a little bit of that with you guys. And that's the context of, um, of what, what is going on. And as David said, um, my route to getting here is kind of interesting. And I think it's interesting in the way that a lot of online stuff is interesting in as much as you put something out there, in this case, our manifesto, which has this paper version, but there's also an online um, version as well. Uh, and things happen that you didn't necessarily <coughs> expect. And I don't think anything that we did when we put this manifesto out would have led me to expect to be standing here in this room with you guys today. And I think that is sort of worth keeping in mind, that there's a little bit of um, serendipity involved in doing things online. And personally, I find that really exciting. But it's, it's, it can be kind of intense and intimidating as well, especially if you're the teacher in charge of um, what's happening in your kind of digital learning spaces. So, um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about sort of five different things. Um, I'm going to introduce the idea that, um, and all, f all five of these points come from various points in this manifesto, it all hangs together, and I'm going to talk about course design for a little bit to sort of orientate you to my thinking around digital learning and how it relates to kind of other, th other ideas about course design. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about place and space and why that is actually still an important idea and a concept um, in the online education. I'm going to move on to talk specifically about some examples of things that we do on our Masters on, in Digital Education program and talk about them in the context of community and contact. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what happens when you try to take those principles of community and contact and place and kind of massify them um, in the context of a MOOC, a massive open online course. 
Uh, and then I'm going to say, really, and I'll start and end by saying this, that there really are a lot of ways to think about online digital education, and I'm going to talk about how we've approached this and how we're thinking about it, but we really strongly believe that there really are a lot of different ways to get this right, and I'd really be enjoying to hear um, your thoughts about your own context and how an online process um, approach might work for you. So that's something that I hope we might have time to talk about at the end. Can everyone hear me okay, by the way? I think my microphone is recording but not projecting. So Susan Tui wrote a book in 1999 that I think is really helpful just in general in thinking about course design. And she says basically that beliefs about knowledge and the nature of learning are revealed in the ways in which teaching spaces are designed. So those, those beliefs, those philosophies of education, they come out in our course design, whether we intend them to or not, whether we know about them or not, they're there. But these beliefs are not just about me and what I think as a teacher. They come from the language that we use, they come from the design of teaching spaces, that's really important in the context of thinking about active learning spaces, for example, um, the allocation of time, and the decisions about assessment. And I also think the disciplinary context in which the course is embedded is significant, really significant, in terms of thinking about the way that design philosophy emerges. So the idea of choice might be kind of complicated here, but I do think that it's useful to consider that our courses are not naturally any particular way. Um, there's a history to the way that courses develop and a philosophical underpinning to them, and those things can change. Um, so the, and the, I think the active learning spaces movement in general is one indication of how that change might happen, and I would say that online and distance education is another indication of how that kind of shift or change could happen those, by people making different choices about what they want their online or their classroom spaces to be like and how they want things to happen within them. So again, just one more point from Tuhi. She has these um, six points about course design. These are the fundamental questions of course design. And the bits highlighted in green are the things that I think are particularly relevant to digital, thinking about digital and online education. Um, so she asks, what characterizes knowledge in our discipline? How does learning occur and how is it best facilitated? What should be the role of teachers and what should be expected of students? What goals and objectives are worthwhile and how are they best expressed? What content is essential and what is desirable and how should it be organized? What purpose do we need assessment to serve and what form should it take? really important one. What resources and infrastructure are needed? So just keep those things in the back of your head a little bit as we carry on talking um, and maybe we'll come back to talk about some of that stuff later but that's a kind of starting point. Another starting point is the video of our manifesto which I'll just leave to run for a moment. Um, this is I think sort of indicating where, where I'm coming from. So this is my philosophy and belief in action and how we have tried to develop the courses that we've developed on our master's in digital education. This video was created by a student on our master's program, James Lamb. Um, we asked him to and he did this fantastic thing and I'll look forward to showing you some more of our student work later on in the talk.
So this was originally written by four of three, myself and three other colleagues. Um, we also spent quite a lot of time talking to students and colleagues and other people on the program team about it. And I think it's fair to say that it now represents a snapshot of our thinking about what it is that we are trying to do. Um, if anyone is interested in trying to surface that in their own context, I highly recommend writing a manifesto. Um, it's, it started out, I was saying to David, being mostly us just repudiating things. Um, but after a while, it's quite, it's quite nice to see the sort of positive, positive statements of principle coming through. And that was a really fascinating process um, that people seem to have um, appreciated some of the points. And I know that some of them are controversial. And I'm happy to talk about more of them later on if people want to. But as Tui says, there's more than just the teacher's values and beliefs going on. Um, online courses have more to them than that. This is the classroom door nearest to my office at the University of Edinburgh, um, the first sign you can probably read, it says, if you move the furniture in the room, please put it back, thank you. And the furniture is all, you know, capital T, <coughs> capital F, like the furniture, don't <laughs> move the furniture. If you move it, you've got to put it back. And the sign underneath, I, I didn't manage to get a good photo of because I was worried that um, the classroom door was going to open and I was going to get shouted at for taking pictures. So um, the, the second one was a post -it that was stuck on, but it was laminated. So I'm thinking this is something that is, you know, they carry around with them. Um, it says, we started at 9 a.m. sharp please wait until 9.30 to come in. So this was like a sign for people who were coming late to the course saying, you know, don't bother coming in if you're late because um, we started already and you've missed it. Um, the spaces, the sort of infrastructure of the university campus makes, a, makes an impact. It has an effect on what can happen within those spaces. I don't think I need to tell anybody that really. But what I would say is that online education is similarly affected by the environments in which it finds itself. And that can be complicated, especially if you're trying to use spaces that are created in a context not necessarily for educational purposes first and foremost, or by companies that are, have other things going on as well as their desire to make really great stuff for students and teachers. Um, this is a quote from a guy called Tarleton Gillespie who writes really interestingly about the politics of platform. He's talking about YouTube here. Um, and he's talking about the whole idea of the platform fitting in with egalitarian and populist appeal to ordinary users. But also um, there's a tension there because there's a platform issue around marketing as well, uh, being a platform for major studio content. And this word platform itself is actually full of meaning um, and full of ways of thinking about and interpreting it. And that's true of all kinds of online digital spaces, even you know, the ones that are designed for educational purposes. Um, this is from a paper about a visual analysis of Blackboard, which is now um, something else. Um, learn, it's now learn. Um, Blackboard. Um, and this was about the spatial or if the spatial organization and visuality of the screen represents and creates a value system and an ontology, what social and pedagogical practices does the VLE, the virtual learning environment, reflect, inform, and inscribe? What meanings does it produce? What version of pedagogy does it make visible? And what alternatives does it blind us to? And to go a little bit further than that, I think, um, Glynis Cousin writes about technology and pedagogy being mutually determining. So she is saying, it's not a question of the pedagogy leading the technology as is often put forward. It's not a question of the technology leading for the pedagogy as people worry about a lot in kind of worries about technological determinist positions. This is, we are, we are affected by our technology. Our technology affects us and we affect it and that is how it is. Um, and I, I think that's a useful starting point for thinking about how the online education process might change what we do, might affect what we do. Um, and I certainly think it's one of the <coughs> important lessons that we've learned. We are not powerless in the context of our technology, but we're not omnipotent either. We've got a relationship with the technology. So I'm going to move on now to talk 
a little bit about the idea of place, which might seem a little bit odd since I'm talking about online distance education, but one important lesson that we have learned from our students primarily is that the concept of place matters a lot to online distance learners. Um, but to really understand why, we sort of have to consider what is meant by the idea of place and what's meant by the idea of presence. Um, now, I'm citing, I'm saying this comes from Jeff Haywood, who's a, <laughs> col a colleague of mine. However, I know that it was actually David who said this in the first place. Um, this is something that's been said in a number of ways um, and a number of times, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite my colleague because um, I can. Uh, that in itself, I think, is... Um, Let's us ask a question about how useful it is to consider that there are just totally two totally different kinds of students. There's the on-campus student, and then there's the online distance learner, and that these are just totally separate categories. And to consider that actually, mm, what does presence mean in the context of, for example, a lecture theater? What does presence mean in the context of a really intimate online tutorial where people are connecting with each other um, in a kind of you know, really meaningful way? Which one of those is more distant, the student at the back of the lecture theater or the student in the online context? Um, I don't know the answer to that, and I think the, the, the issue about space and presence kind of depends where you're, where you're coming from. But there's been quite a lot of work done in recent years about rethinking place and space in education. Um, there's been work on globalization and space by Usher and Edwards. Um, Socio-materiality and actor, actor network theory has come into play in thinking about education. And um, also, there have been um, people using, for example, John Urey's Mobility's Paradigm to talk about education. And here's one quote that's about school education in particular. Um, Leander and uh, his colleagues say, uh, one might, al might almost see the classroom as the epitome of immobility, representing not only conventions of material structure, but also conventions of teaching practice, of schedule, of seating charts, and seat work routines. <coughs> If we deliberately destroy the appearance of solidity, however, what might we observe? What types of materials, books, clay, earthworms, mounds of trash, energies, electricity and gas, resources, federal money, lottery surplus, information flows, channel one, internet, parent phone calls, permeate the classroom from every direction. Moreover, what of the diversity of children and adults entering the classroom doors with their associated histories and geographies? So, this paper is a review paper about all of the work that's been done about education and space in the last decade or so. And they propose that instead of the, the sort of idea of stable space, we think about place, trajectory, and network. And that's the kind of research that we have um, hooked into in a project um, Oh, that we did, which I'll tell you about in a second. But first of all, it's just worth saying that this whole online distance learning thing is growing um, internationally. And I've already mentioned Edinburgh's project um, that's going to fund all of these new programs over the next five years. And there's a sort of policy angle to this as well, which I think has come really to the surface, most of all in thinking about these massive open online courses. That's like the kind of the, the sort of fashionable thing to be talking about at the moment. But actually, there's some other stuff underpinning it about place and space that's interesting as well. Um, so we did a project to try to find out from students on our program what the place of the university meant to them. What did it mean to them to be a student at Edinburgh who was not in Edinburgh? Um, and we looked in particular at the idea of the mobilities paradigm, um, which undermines sedentarist theories present in many studies, and which treats n as normal stability, meaning, and place, and treats as abnormal distance, change, and placelessness. It takes bounded and authentic places or regions or nations as the fundamental basis of human identity and experience. And what we found from our students, two things. One, they really do have a very strong feeling about the University of Edinburgh, but I'll tell, tell you a few different ways that feeling kind of manifests itself. Um, and two, a lot of our students are really undermining that sedentarist sort of idea of place and space because they're on the move. There are people who actually were drawn to, to study in an online distance mode, partly because there are people who move around a lot, who have reasons why they can't be on a campus doing kind of regular mm, lectures and being in particular places at particular times. And I think those are students that we need to think about as higher educators, higher education educators people who are not going to be the sort of full-time on-campus students for a variety of really good reasons and how are we going to 
cope with um, and serve those students in the future. So the answer to the question about what it means to be at Edinburgh not, but not in Edinburgh varied widely, but um, these are all pseudonyms, by the way. Uh, Matthew said, in a strange way, I didn't feel that I wasn't in Edinburgh. Um, Philip said, I may not physically be on campus, but the campus goes with me as part of my cognitive real estate, if you like. And Lilia said something that I think is really quite moving. Um, she says, to be at Edinburgh University means to be online, but also mentally, intellectually, and even emotionally engaged with the course. It's not about where you live and breathe, but what you're reading about, studying, researching, creating. I think for me, being at Edinburgh is being intellectually stimulated, thrown into uncertainty, sort of crisis, living with it, embracing it. I don't think I would do it while in Edinburgh, because the sheer physicality of the place could overwhelm me. And finally, this quote from Penelope, uh, who talks about her experience of being a distance learner. She says, I've studied all over. Generally, I read at home on paper, but I've had bouts of travel. So I've studied reading and discussion board in hotel rooms all over. Hotel rooms are good, because it feels like pleasure and is linked to my normal life. I feel I'm getting time that I wouldn't normally at home. Always on my own at home or in hotels, no one else around. That is one kind of really interesting vision of what it could mean to be a student in a, on a university course or program. Um, and I think all of our students have their own stories about what it feels like to be an online distance learner. And I think we need those stories. We need to understand more about what it is that that experience is like for students. Um, before, before I was a student, we, uh, the Open University in the UK is um, one of the sort of foremost in the world universities for providing online dist well, distance education, first of all, and now online distance education. And I used to get these packs in the mail which said urgent educational material at the front and inside was all of the stuff that you would need for your course, all the books, all the videotapes, the cassettes that you put in your VCR. Um, and it was this great moment when this stuff came through the door because it was like, oh, here it is, this is my course, here it is in this box, right? Um, but I think that we've moved from that kind of, here's the course, it's a correspondence course, this is the history of online di distance learning, if you like, but it's not, it's not the moment we're in now. Um, the moment we're in now has required us to make pretty broad, bold statements on our website about what it means to be an online distance learner on our program. Um, this is still a draft, but I'm sharing it with you because it's sort of close to being what we're going to put up on the website, I think. Um, if you study with us, you'll be in small classes with other students you'll get to know, led by tutors you'll get to know. Experience rich and varied digital environments. Engage in activities that will challenge you. Learn from other students. Work independently on projects. Get rich and supportive feedback. And study in a setting where research and theory are highly valued. And probably most importantly, become part of a community of researchers and practitioners from all over the world. Um, one of our recent graduates said, I learned so much from my tutors and peers, and I felt that we as students were treated as members of a learning community. Ideas were listened to and thoughtfully responded to. I was given the opportunity to think beyond a set curriculum by choosing my own topics and areas for exploration and engage in a variety of new learning experiences. I was encouraged to take risks <coughs> and rewarded for ent entering into those wholeheartedly. I mean, this, obviously, I want you to say, oh my gosh, that sounds like a great program. But I think the point is, this is what any teacher would want their student to say about <coughs> the experience that they have taking a class. Um, and I think it's really wonderful that we can think about an online distance program as providing these sorts of experiences for students. And I think a lot of that is the way that we are now being shaped by the technology that at our disposal and the ways in which those contacts can be made that they couldn't perhaps have been made at the time when the Open University was sending its urgent educational, but they may, maybe still do send those. Um, there's, there's some new stuff going on and I think we should kind of try to figure out how to embrace that in a way that doesn't undermine what we've been trying to do as teachers, as educators, but sort of builds on it and lets new stuff in. Cory Doctor, about 10 years, well, maybe it wasn't quite 10 years ago, said, conversation is king. Content is just something to talk about. This has become a kind of mantra for the web, for the way that people are engaging with um, each other online. But I think that if the content is not the course, if the content is not the course, then we have to think 
about what we are talking about in terms of independence and in terms of delivery. We have to rethink all of that stuff if we're not going to send somebody a box of urgent educational material and let them get on with it. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's not a problem, but it's a challenge that we still, as, as educators involved in online distance education, have to continually think about. So in my explorations of active learning spaces, I've stolen this graphic from Christopher Brooks, um, who was, I think, here before. Um, this is a graphic of one of the active learning classrooms in, at the University of Minnesota. Um, I've kind of discovered that there are some, some principles, some ideas that seem to underpin active learning spaces, that they're connected, that the people are within them are connected to each other, but also that they're kind of digitally connected, that they're intimate, that people get to know one another on a quite a kind of intimate level, that they're busy, like loud and noisy and people moving around all the time, it's not a quiet classroom, that they're creative, they allow people to kind of explore new ways of representing knowledge, that they're exploratory, so they give um, the opportunity to actually experiment and do things, try things, as opposed to, to hearing about them. Um, and that they're inspiring for teachers and for students. Um, and I've, I've quoted Kim, who um, appears in a really good video that was put out here at SPU, um, that the space has given me an opportunity to think about what we're doing in the classroom differently. Um, I would just like to say that that, that resonates with me almost completely in terms of how I think about the opportunities of, of teaching in an online distance mode. It's that opportunity to think about how it could be and how it could be different. So I want to suggest that these qualities of active learning spaces are also qualities of digital learning spaces. And I'm going to give an example from our program of each of these sort of ideas or qualities. Um, and except for inspiring, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of those. This is uh, an image from an alumni seminar, a seminar event that we held a couple of months ago. Um, up at the front on the podium is one of our alumni, Michael Gallagher, who's talking about his PhD research that he's gone on to do since leaving the program. Um, sitting around, this is Second Life, if people aren't familiar with it, um, sitting around on the, on the logs are students, alumni, teachers and even our external examiner. I don't know if you guys have that here, but the person who, who's sort of, yeah, okay, <laughs> in charge of saying whether the program is doing well. And um, it's, it was such a great, I mean, it's a great environment to sit, to sit and talk to people in. And he was um, giving a voice presentation and showing his slides. And this is something we try to do every year to invite a couple of alumni to come and talk to current students and staff about what, the, what it is that they're doing. And it's something that we can do in a kind of visually rich way by using Second Life. So we do that. Um, and that's just one of the many ways. You know, often when alumni leave, you, don't, you try to keep in contact with them, but it's not that easy. But it actually is much easier in an online distance context because people are still kind of where they were before. And to make that contact still <coughs> feels possible. And, um, and we, we, we're trying to make it work. This is a screenshot from the public side of our weblog environment. So students, um, from the very beginning of their time on program with us, keep a weblog on their first course, which is just between them and one tutor who will comment on their posts every week. This is not the real bit of the blog, because I didn't want to take a screenshot of stuff that was not public. But these are just a few of the posts that were made public by students for various reasons on different courses. Um, the, the, the blogging activity that happens at the beginning of the program is incredibly time intensive for the teacher because they've got you know, X number of students that they're commenting on the work of every week. But we think that front loading that contact early on provides people not only with a kind of academic grounding for the program, but also lets them get that stuff about, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing, this technology is confusing, something broke, out, out of the way in a kind of supportive way to let them move on with the program. And students often say that, A, they didn't want to blog, and blogging is stupid, and they hated it, and B, <laughs> and B that it was the most amazing ex educational experience that many of them had had. That kind of one-to-one -one dialogue with a teacher over a whole 12-week period really made a big difference to people, and I think it really helps with our retention. Um, I know that's a big buzzword at the moment, and we've got um, a retention rate of over 90% on our program. And we think this is at least 
you know, a big significant part of, of what helps people stay with it. Because people want to stay. I mean, nobody signs up for a program wanting to not manage to finish it. But it's harder. It's hard. And this is one of the things that makes it feel easier for people. Um, <laughs> Twitter is funny, right? Because it's like you can't really do anything very significant in 140 characters, as has often been said. And yet, over time, and when there's enough stuff going on, it starts to build up a picture. This is three, well, the first, the first column is the sort of general MSc pro master's program Twitter feed. The second one is the introductory course, and the third one is um, the e-learning and digital cultures course. And actually, reading those three different feeds, you get a really, you do get a really strong, I get a really strong sense of activity and noise and movement and people do manage to make meaning and to make that kind of contact in a way that feels good and supportive um, and engaging and so this is one of the this is one of the ways in which we sort of give people a window into the exciting busy world that everyone else is inhabiting and it works it works really well for that oh and it's what we call um, ambient collegiality one of our students uh, coined that, you know, this idea that you can kind of get to know what people are doing without having to kind of make a huge investment in sort of ringing them up or whatever. This is ambient, ambient collegiality. That was Tony McNeil who coined, coined that. One of the weeks um, on our e-learning and digital cultures course, we asked students this time to engage with what was going on in the MOOC and to try to um, represent visually something of what was happening in that space. And this is one of, the, um, one of the images that was created by one of the students on that course, trying to capture the conversations that were going on about dystopian futures of technology. Um, and doing stuff visually, doing stuff um, multimodally, so bringing in you know, text and images and all kinds of different things, is something that the digital environment makes really easy even for people who don't consider themselves to be artsy. Um, and we find that students engage so enthusiastically with tasks that ask them to be visual, ask them to make videos, ask them to kind of represent their knowledge in non-textual, non-essay forms. And um, so we're doing increasing more of this. We allow students to write digital essays for their final assignments for a lot of our courses. Um, we have even started to encourage people to write their dissertations in kind of non-traditional formats. And one student has so far <laughs> done it, but you know, I think more will come. It's very high stakes. It's hard, right? Because you know how to write well. People know what the sort of structure is for a dissertation that is 15,000 words and it's a, you know, you have the introduction and then you've got your literature review and what do you, what do you do if somebody says, well, actually, you could try a different way. So it's, it's still a work in progress, but we're sort of interested in, in that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the courses that I, I teach is called Digital Futures <coughs> for Learning. And the trouble with <laughs> digital futures is that you cannot really plan in advance a course like that. So what we do is invite students to create um, seminars for each other. They start in about week five of the 12-week process and they spend three weeks kind of finding out more about a topic that's interesting to them in relation to one of the themes. And then they make a tutorial, a seminar, an online seminar that can be in any format, um, real time or um, asynchronous, and they can do anything they want with it. And it's marked by the people, it's peer assessed. Um, and they get excited and do they ever make things? Um, I think there's something about the real world consequences of making something for the people it's intended for and then those people are going to assess it that kind of fires people up quite a, a bit. Also the, the subject area is really interesting which I would say because it's my course but um, <laughs> this kind of I, I don't know, I think this, this issue about making things really have consequences is something that is you know, pedagogically sound in all kinds of different um, disciplines and areas. And again, it's something that I think can work well in an online environment and something we're, we're trying to do lots of. So for inspiring, I thought the best thing to do would be to show you a few examples of the kinds of assignments, assessed work that students do on the program. Um, I'll just show you little clips of things. I'm not going to... Um, show a big amount of st but this is a digital essay that was created um, <coughs> by one of the students on the program and he used um, a voiceover over top of a fly through of a Google Earth um, I'll just let I'll just let a little bit of it play <coughs> 
explore this notion of <coughs> cultural heritage studies with mobile augmented reality using select locations in New York City as the <coughs> to be mediated and mediate. <laughs> number three, learner is <coughs> cultural heritage learner, the role of mischief in learning. The overriding ontological question for this exploration is what effect does this discipline and this technology have on the <laughs> In keeping with the ontological shift for the learner further by augmented reality and cultural heritage studies, this analysis will present possible representations of knowledge made possible through the combination of augmented reality and the recasting of the learner as learner. These representations will be cast in brackets and embedded within the analysis itself. <coughs> Part one, augmented reality and mobile <coughs> recasting the body. So, so um, for the whole of this essay, Michael, this is Michael Gallagher, who was shown in the Second Life fit, um, screenshot earlier on walked through the streets of Manhattan um, as a sort of the, the, the sort of trope of the essay was about the flanner. So he was being a flanner in the digital space of Manhattan, lower Manhattan um, to talk about cultural, digital cultural heritage education. Um, and it was, it was good. <laughs> um, this, <coughs> is this, I'm just gonna check what, <coughs> how much time we have because I'd like to actually show you this in Second Life for a moment. Nope, I'm not going to do that. Um, this is me standing in the pile of references for uh, the essay that the student in A.S. McNulty built in Second Life. The essay was about the figure of the cyborg um, and how that's, been, how that's changed over time. Uh, he had two, two floors of this building. The first floor had a bunch of quotes and ideas about the cyborg. The second floor had um, some uh, actual cyborg, decomposing cyborg figures, and the third floor was a video, so you went up in an elevator and watched this video of him talking with, a, with the Blade Runner theme song in the background. Um, he also had a, an automated um, robot avatar who would greet you when you came, um, and she was called Unheimlich, which means unhomely, and she was um, the sort of cyborg, she would come up and say, hello, this is the essay, here's a, here's a postcard for you. Um, she was really creepy, I didn't like her. <laughs> And this, I, I think w the points in the manifesto that refer to the idea that assessment is a creative crisis and that we are being asked to do the work of assessment in a different way when we're thinking about visual and hypertextual essays is really about this kind of thing. How do you assess something like this when the form is actually as relevant to what it is the students try to do as the content? You know, the content was good, but in a, in a kind of just a straightforward Word document emailed to me as a tutor, I don't think I would be showing you this. And because of what it is, it's, it's more than just a kind of essay. And how you, how you deal with that as, a, as an assessor is something that um, is a real challenge for teachers, especially ones who don't come from an arts background where actually such things are dealt with and coped with and have been for a long time. Um, this was a blog-based assignment, um, and what made it interesting was not only the blog itself, but the auto-ethnographic approach that the author took. Um, she basically wrote reflect her own reflections on this, the essay topic as she was writing the essay, which a blog format sort of allows, encourages, if you like. Um, this was... Uh, a, a web-based essay that had a kind of non-linear <coughs> format, so you could choose to click around from any direction. There was no kind of set reading path, and the whole essay was sort of exploring that. Um, this was one of the seminars from the Digital Futures course that I was talking about, and um, Carl, uh, who made this made this seminar, wrote a great review of the seminar and everything that happened. And there was just like all the stuff that people had contributed to this seminar, just much way more than you would ever expect someone to do in a in a kind of 4,000, 2,000 word essay. People were just investing a huge amount of time and effort to make this thing what it was, which was excellent. Uh, this is the one um, non-standard format dissertation that I was mentioning. Um, this was uh, Nicola Osborne, who finished just last year. 
And even though it's non-standard, i.e. It's, it's in a web essay, um, it's pretty standard. It's still kind of quite structured. And I think that asking students to go beyond that is going to take an investment and a leap of faith on our part as well as on their part that we're still, we're still figuring out how to. And I'd like to talk about that with people if they're interested. <coughs> Um, and this was a Prezi format. Um, again, you know, just an example of how, and not, not only that, but um, she had the, all of these videos running simultaneously to give a kind of sense of noise and cacophony, um, which was what it was about. And it was, anyway, it was fascinating. Uh, and this is just, you know, a handful of the examples of the different kinds of things that students can attempt to do in the online space that they couldn't necessarily, especially if they aren't kind of, if they aren't artists, if they aren't kind of people who, would think of themselves normally as creative. Um, there's lots of ways to be creative in online environments for anybody, which is really great um, and something that is good to try to make use of if you're teaching things online. So, the MOOC. This was interesting, right? Because a lot of what we've said about what we do is about community, is about contact, and we've sort of hung our hats on the idea that that is what you can do in, in an online space. You can be, have intimate, contactful relationships between teachers and students and between students. And then we got asked to make a MOOC. Now, a MOOC, if, if people aren't familiar with it, is completely open. It can take any number of people. Um, ours had 42,000 people signed up for it by the time it started. About half of those actually began. Um, and by the final week, there was five, the five-week course, there were about 5,000 people still active on the site. Now, 42,000 to 5,000 may not seem that great, but 5,000, still a lot. <laughs> um, we sent out a hashtag early on, a Twitter hashtag, before the course started, well before the course started, and it exploded. So the course wasn't due to start till the beginning of January. We sent a hashtag in November, and I'll show you in a second some of the stuff people made before the MOOC had even started. About a week before it actually started, somebody said, well, I don't know what we can possibly do on the course, because this has just been so exciting and thrilling. I'm really like, great, that's perfect. Um, so a MOOC is, is massive in terms of enrollment numbers. It's open, so there's no mandatory prior qualifications. Anyone can sign up. Um, it's fully online, and what makes it sort of different from an open educational resource is that it's, it's structured and it happens at a particular time. The University of Edinburgh ran six MOOCs on the Coursera platform back in February. Um, these were the first six that we'd done, and Edinburgh was the first UK university to sign up to the Coursera platform. Um, there's since been another one, and there's also a new platform in the UK called Future Learn <coughs> that's being developed there in the UK. But this is the one that we have gone with. And um, really, there's a few reasons why Edinburgh got involved. To, to build on the culture of digital education, which I was talking about before, to explore these new teaching and learning environments and to expand the reach of the university. And I think a lot of universities have that last one in common with us, that it, this is about primarily about finding ways to reach more people with the great news that the university exists and that it's fantastic and that people should get involved. Uh, this was what I was mentioning about some of the stats. Um, we were very interested to see that 61% of our um, people who enrolled for our, our uh, introductory undergraduate course were, had a postgraduate degree already, um, and 60% of them were employed in education. I think ours was kind of different in as much as people were sort of coming on board to see what a MOOC design might look like, and we kind of knew that would happen. So we, we, weren't, we weren't upset about that, but it was a bit weird to have people saying, well, as a PhD in philosophy, I believe, you know, as a psychologist uh, working in the field for 20 years, I really don't think you should have done this in, ex in week two, or you know, this is very simplistic approach to the topic. Like, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, though, uh, it paid off. <laughs> so this was a survey we sent out at the end of the MOOC, um, and of those who responded who had been actively involved in the MOOC at some level, not everybody completed it, and that was fine. Um, there was something like 82% of people felt it was good or very good or excellent, which is great because the one thing you don't want to have happen is to put stuff out there and to try to kind of do something on a massive scale and for people to really hate it. That did happen to another MOOC that was running at the same time as ours, um, also in the field of online education. And it was definitely one of those moments where you think, oh, you know, it, obviously we, ours was fantastic and that would never have happened to us, but that moment of just thinking, oh, I'm so glad that didn't happen to us. Um, was definitely, yeah, it was, it was a moment. 
So our course was not structured like a normal MOOC. MOOCs typically, the, the kind of Coursera style MOOCs typically have <coughs> lectures from the teacher, talking head type lectures. Um, we didn't do any of that. We provided a set of resources each week with some questions and then bits of interpretation around them and asked people to engage with them, not only in the discussion forums, but also in their own blogs on Twitter, all over the web. Um, <coughs> We had a couple of Google Hangouts, um, Google Plus Hangouts, at the end of two of our weeks where the course team got together, well, not got online and talked about some of the stuff that had happened during the week. Uh, we also had a blog that we ran, um, that we blogged every day during the MOOC to sort of talk about our experiences of teaching the MOOC, the five of us. <coughs> And we had a blog aggregator which brought together posts from all over the web. Anyone who was blogging could use the hashtag and put their blog into the system so that anytime they post something new, it would appear on this page. Um, it was a bit of a, a technological hurdle to get there, but once we did, uh, it was really exciting to see the stuff that people were creating outside the confines of the, of the discussion forum space. So, Students, as I was saying, did a bunch of stuff without us before we were even involved, um, just off the, off the back of the hashtag that we provided. Um, they created a student Facebook group which had 4,800 people and signed up for it. They created a Google Plus group. They were tweeting every day. Um, that, that's an, the figure that sort of indicates how many people were, being, were following the people who were tweeting about ABC MOOC. So if you see 26,000, 27,000 Twitter accounts, that's how many people might potentially have been seeing the tweets about the MOOC. Um, a few of the people started their own hashtag to be able to have live Twitter chats, and that happened, um, I think, every week of the MOOC, and is still going on. The MOOC has been over for a week, a uh, month and a half or two months, and it's still happening, these EDCM chat things, because they love them so much. They keep doing them. Um, and 915 blogs being pulled into that news page that I showed you just now, plus all the posts in the discussion forum, of which there were many. And that doesn't include all the stuff that was happening on the blog posts and the exchanges on the Facebook page and the, all of the other places where we couldn't really track what was happening, but we know there was stuff going on. Uh, before, again, before the MOOC started, somebody set up a Google map. Um, it had to be shut down because it, it exceeded the number of pins that you can have. There were a thousand, I think you can't get more than a thousand onto a shared map, so they um, had to stop. But, the, but, but by the time they got to a thousand, this is where, the, and everybody put a pin with their Twitter hashtag and a sort of note of where they were. And so people could see where others were and make connections that way as well. Genius, right? I mean, we might have thought of that, but we didn't. It was them. They did it. Geniuses. Um, someone also set up this EDC MOOC school, which was to help new people who were coming in to find different stuff that they might want. That in relation, this was again nothing to do with us, absolutely nothing to do with us. Um, just gathering together resources of stuff that people were making ahead of time. And uh, there was a great video that was made by one of the MOOC participants about this idea of the sorts of things that can happen before, around and before a MOOC if you allow for the kind of contact and the um, connections that we, we tried to encourage. Um, I won't show it just now, but I can show it later if you want. Um, one, I was mentioning that some of our students were in the MOOC making some, um, making some observations in one of the weeks of the MOOC and this was one of the things that they made to sort of reflect the things that people were experiencing in the MOOC. Um, it's okay to try to deal with contact at this kind of level with 42,000 or 20,000 people, whatever, but people are going to get overwhelmed and they did. So this, put, this was sort of trying to pull together, synthesize some of the stuff that was going on in the MOOC and the response to the, to the attempt at the synthesis from one of our students was just so overwhelmingly positive <coughs> that people really appreciated somebody trying to make sense out of the kind of <coughs> massiveness of the MOOC um, and, and that worked well. There were also people talking, there was a lot of talk within the MOOC about not only about the content but about the process and this is another one of those. So this was um, somebody kind of collating all of the strategies that she'd found useful in relation to the MOOC and publishing it for other people to share um, and, and see. And I think these are good, this is good advice, <laughs> good advice for a MOOC. 
people made smaller groups to do things like this. This was a voice thread conversation between about 12 or 13 people um, that went on again over a couple of weeks period. Um, people were leaving little voice comments for each other and it was really, really interesting. But again, they made it, made it public, let people come and see it and check it out and join in if they wanted to as well. So it's these ways of making the massive into something um, at a scale that people could deal with, even if they then went, went on to um, engage with different sort of little communities that were forming. There was definitely a sense that people were fi trying to find people they could connect with and engage with. And a lot of the feedback we got from the MOOC was about people talking about having those who managed to find those connections between themselves and other individuals were the ones who really enjoyed the MOOC and people who didn't manage to make those connections often were the ones who were feeling overwhelmed. So one of the things that, one of the lessons that we've learned or we're trying to learn for next time is how to support everybody who wants to make those, not everybody does, some people want to work on their own and that's fine, but how to support everybody who wants those connections <coughs> to make them um, successfully. So that's a good one. So in the third week of the MOOC, we asked people to make an image that represented that week's MOOC content. And there were, um, I think maybe six or 700 of those. Um, some of the examples, so this was, uh, this was an image of loads and loads of people's um, activity within the MOOC. Somebody did a whole beautiful set of images um, about a, a robot teacher, so that it was the diary of a teaching machine. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's home, she's just a bit busy with EDC MOOC, it says. <laughs> Uh, and Mooker goes to therapy. <laughs> Doctor, I think I'm an addicted Mookaholic. Please describe your symptoms. I get overexcited in conversations taking place on Coursera, Twitter, Facebook, etc., and constantly check for updates. Do you also take part in the EDCM chat on Saturdays? And do you check EDC Mook first thing in the morning? Yes, exactly. You are not alone, my friend. I will give you a blue pill called Get a Life. Seems to be working for me. <laughs> the final assignment for the Mook. Um, try, we tried to keep it in keeping with the rest of the MOOC, which was a sort of open distributed approach, um, was inviting people to make an online digital artifact. So they were invited to do something in any format they wanted to that had something to do with the MOOC content. And again, like everything else in the MOOC, as soon as people started creating these, they started to share them. And this is a Padlet, it used to be called Wallwisher, um, a Padlet page that I think has something like 1,500 um, assignments linked from it. People, somebody sent the link around and people just went and started adding their assignments. So this is a wonderful resource for seeing what happened in that first instance of the MOOC. What I really liked about the assignments and the way people approached them was that people did what they did, you know, people did the things that they had skill and ability in and they made it relevant to the MOOC. So this was a, an artist's assignment and it was this beautiful long page that um, scrolled down and down with great music behind it. This is uh, by a, vi a filmmaker called Amy Burville who has done all kinds of fabulous things on YouTube and we were very um, excited to see this. This is great, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, it's great on many levels, but what's especially great about it is that it basically encapsulates 
what the MOOC was about, which was about how digital culture and education were kind of connected to each other and what the issues were. And it's just brilliant, right? Brilliant. Um, someone else, uh, a guy based in the UK who's a web developer, made this really fascinating thing called a Rouchergram. Ed Rouché is a, an artist who um, creates these kind of giant images with words across them and he made this thing where you could upload your own picture and um, add your own text and create this Rouchergram thing um, and it was really cool and the really extra cool thing about it was that I was at another meeting with some people who were involved in the museum um, who were working with Ed Rouchet on something and they sent him the link to this thing that was on the web that had been made as part of the movie. Now I haven't heard back yet but apparently he was going to like it so we'll, we'll wait to hear. <laughs> And um, finally, about the MOOC, really, just one person's take on what it, a MOOC feels like, which I think you'll, you'll see has echoes of what it is that we're talking about in our master's program as well. <laughs> um, I think that that brings us back full circle really to the conversations earlier about the, the place, the place of online education, the space of it. Um, it turns out that you can do the sorts of things at scale that we were trying to do, that we are trying to do on our master's program. They just look really different and also I think the role of the teacher in that space is quite different because we cannot know every student, we cannot figure out how to support 20,000 people. Um, we had to let the network do the work of making those connections with each other. And it's a work in progress because actually what a lot of people were saying in their feedback was that they wanted more of the teacher presence. And we were there, I mean, we were blogging every day, we were responding to things, but because we weren't kind of making an over um, an overbearing presence in, in the form of those video lectures or whatever. I think that's partly why the stuff that happened around the edges happened. They weren't the edges actually, the, the stuff that happened, the, the, the student-led stuff happened because we weren't there saying this is what you must do, but also it led some people to feel that we weren't there enough. So that's a kind of interesting challenge for the next time. Um, but it was an absolute thrill to see this stuff happen in the way that it did um, during this instance of the MOOC. And we've learned a lot from it, actually, about how, because this was written well before we even knew we were going to make a MOOC. Um, we've learned a lot from the MOOC process. Probably the next version of this manifesto will be different as a result of that. Um, but it has been a really, really interesting experience. So to close, I just want to reiterate what I said before. This is how we've approached these kinds of issues. This is the stuff we think is important, but I do think there are just lots of different ways that you might think about online education, online digital teaching and learning. 
Um, and here are a couple of uh, <coughs> quotes that might be helpful if you're thinking about how to go forward with this. Um, in 2005, Glynis Cousin said, if the, world, if the web is worldwide, the university is the nation state. The latter finds safety in small numbers, proximity, intimacy, familiarity, definable boundaries, disciplinary and tutor authority, linearity, role separation, fixity, and hierarchies. The former posits the limit beyond the skies. All is possible. The map is the territory. The medium is definitely the message. The message being that all contact, fleeting or sustained, is possible. And my colleague Shan says, what would a digital pedagogy look like which engaged purposefully with fluid, haunted space? It would be one in which the material distancing of teacher from student and student from student was not seen as a question of compromise, but as a positive embrace of a different kind of presence, one which opens up new ways of defining and rethinking contact. Thanks a lot. So we have time for your questions. Um, if you'd like to ask them. So what was your overall purpose as a loop? What, what were you hoping to accomplish? We were hoping to, I mean, we were asked to do it as part of the university's first sort of foray into MOOCs. So in a sense, we were hoping to do something that would be of the sufficient quality to make the university look good, for one thing. Um, for our own purposes, we were looking to find out how practices of contact and community could work in, at scale. Um, so we were looking to find out how our beliefs about online education and how its quality comes from contact and community could play out in that, at that kind of scale and we didn't think that the way that a lot of MOOCs were being run at that time was quite getting it, although the, the connectivist MOOCs, the MOOCs that, the first MOOCs, the C MOOCs, um, which were, are based entirely around networks and communities, um, gave a good, a good steer in that direction. Um, and also, <coughs> we really wanted people who worked in the field of digital education and online learning to think about the digital culture angle, um, which we didn't think was happening very much. A lot of the online courses about online education tend to be quite <coughs> pragmatic, and we wanted something that was a little more conceptual and theoretical. So those are the sorts of reasons. So there's like a, an institutional reason, a pedagogical reason, and a kind of disciplinary reason. Yes. Right, so there was kind of a kind of a freebie. That's true. Come see us. Absolutely. We thought <laughs> we thought. I mean, we really didn't know, and I think we still don't know whether this idea, which the people have bandied about, <clears throat> that you could use a MOOC as a sort of mechanism for driving people to your programs, uh, was something that was ever going to. And we have had we have had inquiries from people who have taken the MOOC and I don't I think our cl next closing date for September admissions is in a couple of weeks so we'll see um, but we thought it was more likely for us than for on-campus programs who run MOOCs that people would come um, but I think it's too it's a little a little too, too soon to say but it would be great if it did happen because I think what the MOOC is in a way is it shows what we're about um, to on a really big scale to people who might not otherwise ever know about our program um, and that's been sort of simultaneously terrifying and, and good. I think it's maybe a related question to that is, um, I mean, it, that certainly one way to think of the MOOC as a, as a, as a way of reaching out to people um, and making that kind of initial contact uh, and even deepening that, that initial contact. I'm, I'm sort of wondering in terms of a coursework as a you know, as a, as a progress towards uh, some kind of a, a degree, mm -hmm. um, which is the way we typically think about corporate work in university. Um, do you see, uh, do you see that as, as being sort of a place where MOOCs are going in the future? Yeah, that question of accreditation, I think is, is the big, a big one, the big one. Um, we, for this MOOC, we're not trying to grapple with that because I think it would have just been a step too far to try to do something a little bit out there, um, pet, you know, in terms of course design and to try to figure out how it could be accreditable. Uh, 
I think it's the holy grail of MOOC development and you know there's a lot of investment going into these things at the moment and it's really hard at the moment to see how the companies who are investing in MOOCs are going to get their money back um, as if they don't crack this accreditation issue. So I think there's a lot of people thinking about it right now and there's been some interesting developments like um, the idea that you could um, authorize yourself, you know, uh, authenticate yourself through your typing style or through even things like um, peop um, iris scanning and stuff so that you could do some kind of online exam that would prove that you were, had, had reached the, the standard required for the MOOC. Um, I, you know, because we have kind of questions and issues about surveillance, that's like a little bit problematic perhaps, but, um, but it's interesting. Uh, there are other models being suggested where people might um, pay to come and have, or to get on Skype and have a kind of 20 minute exam with somebody. So, you know, if you pay enough money, you can have 20 minutes or half an hour of lectures time to be quizzed on the things that the MOOC covered to find out whether you really know them or not. Um, there's a whole bunch of really smart people thinking about this, and I suspect that it won't be long before we start to see really these things being worth credit in some way or other. It's hard to know how universities are going to react to that and whether universities beyond those who are offering the MOOCs and even sometimes the universities who are offering the MOOCs will be happy to accept that credit because that's how, you know, There's that's... On Coursera's website, it talks about universities offering credit to MOOCs. Yes, and at the moment, I think what you can do... Um, the thing I know about is the statement of you, the statement of accomplishment you can get. You can also pay to get um, a certification for having passed the MOOC. Um, uh, and yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. There are some some accreditation accreditation things going on as well. Um, Amy Collier talked about the digital or uh, distributed lib. How could that play into like universities credit? <coughs> yeah, Amy's idea. Um, is about finding ways to use the the event of the MOOC and the content of the MOOC as a as a way to um, let people in local communities use that use that stuff um, in their own local communities, but using using the materials from the MOOC. Uh, I think it's very a very interesting model. Um, again, I think it sort of depends on what that MOOC content is, right? Because if it's a series of lectures, yeah, you could see how you could use somebody else could use it, but it's harder to imagine how you could use, for example, EDC MOOCs content, which is sort of being created on the go, if you like. It's hard. It's harder to imagine that, but I think for a lot of MOOCs, it could it could work well, really well. And it's very interesting to think about how those local um, communities might be able to use. Because one of the big problems with the MOOC is, you know this question of retention is not really a good question in a sense because retention doesn't mean anything in the context of a MOOC. The, the easiest thing to do in, in a MOOC is sign up for it and everything after that gets harder, right? So to think about retention rates is just not the right thing. Um, but to think about how you support people who are not necessarily um, experienced learners to get through a, a difficult MOOC, even if it is a first year undergraduate level, you've got to be self-motivated, you've got to have a lot of skills, learning skills to be able to do a MOOC um, and finding ways for communities to be able to support each other to do that kind of stuff I think is really has a lot of promise as well. You spoke about um, the role of community for celebratory um, or supportive like, mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, like critical feedback um, and objective assessment? How, how does the community differ online masters versus uh, yeah well in the online masters um, we do invest quite a lot of time in building up at the beginning of every course a sort of community of people who know how to give each other critical feedback and we as the teachers can also model that really well because we're there and we're you know the small classes so we can we can do that work of, of challenging I think it can be really challenging it, it can be more cha a challenge can feel more challenging in an online environment because you don't have all the kind of happy you know context around it to sort of let somebody know that you know you love them but you're going to tell them this thing because it's you know it's for their own good um, getting that getting that sense of you know that we're here to support you but what you just said is just really wrong um, is very hard and in fact that um, that dissertation that I was showing um, Nicola Osborne's dissertation she was looking at um, social networking and continuing professional development and one of the things she found was that 
if people wanted to correct somebody who'd made a comment or something said something wrong on a space like Twitter, they would almost never correct them on Twitter. They would go private and send them an email or send them a direct message or something. So what happens is you get all these um, wrong things being said and then silence because the con con conversation continues offline or in a, in a less public space because people don't want to embarrass one another and that is not an issue for somebody on a small course but for a big in the in the bigger sense that issue of criticality i think is one that we do need to s give significant thought to definitely so it seems like there's a tension here it, that i just uh, referring back to that quote content is not the course conversation is key mm -hmm. so it seems like there's a epistemic belief in that mm -hmm. that is that tensions in part of knowledge from constructed knowledge. Mm -hmm. And with that comes a challenge around how we organize for learning, which tends to be around how we organize content. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe you can speak to some of that tension and address it. Because I think that whole idea of content then pushes towards accreditation, and yeah. towards standards, or you know, policy that supports or denies that kind of work. Yeah, and I think that's really useful to draw that out because um, I suppose because that is the case, because those issues about content are driving so much of what's happening in, you know, in MOOCs, in online education, the, the reaction against that, that that we are kind of trying to, is, is a reaction against, it's, it's one half of that conversation. So I think that's right, that the other half is about um, how to provide the best quality content for people who might not otherwise be able to access it. And I think, I, I don't want to underplay how important that is, but at the end of the day, the, 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 way, that, the way that MOOCs in particular are playing out is, is suggesting, I guess, that you know, knowledge is this thing that is kind of easy to package up and that, that, that once you've packaged it in, a, in the best possible way and given it to the world, then there's nothing more that needs to be done. And I just don't think that is what knowledge, I think it's exa you're exactly right, it's an epistemological issue because that's not what knowledge is. It's something that is created and, cha and it changes. It's not, you know, it's not static. And so this issue about content and packaging of content and that urgent educational material coming through the door is okay as long as you know that you're going to have to redo that urgent educational material next time and you have to give people space to question it and find out you know, what it means for them. Uh, sorry, I didn't say that very well, but I think you, you know. Well, I think it's one that we're, that's an issue we wrestle with all the time. Yeah. I think it, it seems to me what you've presented here in terms of digital learning and, and the community of learning in the digital space. Mm. Uh, I sense that. Yeah. Tension. Yeah. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. Well, what are the good things? One of the things you said that struck me is the design of the physical mm -hmm. the, uh, digital space for learning is we need to think about the way we think about the design of classrooms. Yeah. What what are good resources or or things that we can look at to think about how because I'm not big <laughs> you're getting a you're getting a round of applause, by the way. So I'm wondering what we could look at to, and I know so I like to very careful say not best practices. Good practices. Good, good practices. So you can see how we can design something that is inviting yeah. for a student and, and not this rigidness. Of, yeah. You know, I, I wish I could say, you know, there's this great website that shows you all these really alternative ways to design courses so online, but I haven't seen, I haven't really seen that. Um, but I think that asking those kinds of right questions to start with is sort of the best, the best starting point is to say, how do, how do we invite people into this space and make them want to be there? Um, I think, you know, this point in the manifesto about the need for um, aesthetics in the online distance, online digital space is something that, you know, people who develop websites that they want people to sign up for pay a massive amount of attention to, and we just don't pay enough attention to it in education. We need beautiful spaces that people want to be in. Um, and if we don't have them, you know, if the, if the virtual learning environments that our universities are providing to us 
are not beautiful enough, then I just think there actually is a limit to how much you can accomplish in that space. It sounds weird, but actually, you know, you just you just can't go beyond a certain point if you can't be somewhere that is be that feels beautiful. Like you know, you need you need the digital trees somehow or other. We have to get those in there. Um, and actually, what's interesting is our um, we, our program. We do use a virtual learning environment for a few things. We moved from an old version of WebCT to Moodle this year. And the way that the course design has kind of emerged from the change to Moodle is so weird because it's very linear and it's just really changed the way a lot of the courses are kind of structured and functioning. Um, it really makes, it does make a huge difference. The space makes a very big difference. So thanks for asking. If I think of anything, I'll pass it on to David. And but it, it looks like you've actually been using the spaces where people already are. Like you didn't, you know, all the places you were showing, you were showing WordPress, you were showing yeah. Twitter, you were showing Facebook, you were showing Google Plus. Yeah. You know, it looks like, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like you're actually using a lot of spaces where people really already are hanging out. Well, we're letting people use them. We're not, we're not kind of, I mean, the spaces that we use on our master's program, um, typically, we do use WordPress for a few things. Um, we really like WordPress. Um, we, but we use Moodle, we use WordPress, we use um, a wiki called PBWorks for some of our course spaces. We don't really use Facebook, for example, on the program because we just want people to use that only if they want to because it's, you know, so problematic in so many ways. Um, and we do try things in different environments all the time because partly of what the subject matter of the program is, people need to experience a lot of different environments. But I think it's more the issue of letting people do things in the spaces that they want to work in than us to go there and do things there. Um, that is working well for us in terms of letting people do digital assignments in a format that works for them and trying stuff in spaces that they've always wanted to try and never got around to or whatever. Um, that happened on the MOOC as well, people said, you know, I didn't expect, um, I expected this, this MOOC to be all sort of dry theory and stuff, but I learned how to use VoiceThread and I've always wanted to do that and that was amazing. Um, it's, yeah, it's a good, you know, it's a good, it's a good practice to get into to give people some freedom to spec their own assignments, but also their own assignment formats. It's helpful. How, are we still on film? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, what I will say is that um, it's it's been a bit of a work in progress to figure out what exactly because Coursera is is a small ambitious company. You know, they're doing um, a lot with with only a few, obviously, really amazing, intelligent people. Um, so, and but they've been extremely responsive um, to ideas and suggestions. But the ideas and suggestions can't get implemented very fast because there's so much going on for them. Um, so the experience has been one of kind of a sense of people being really engaged and interested in what we're trying to do, um, and then you know, an, a medium amount of progress in, in getting there. But I think watch the space probably because they're they're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yes, we think we might run um, the MOOC again in November, so that will give us time to figure out how we want to change it for the next time and any, anything we want to do, um, we'll have time to do it, uh, but it doesn't wait too long if people are waiting for it, because you know they're queuing up waiting for it. <laughs>